because in a sense, the apple is using us and the marijuana plant is using us as well. And so whether we want to say that of the cow as well, I have difficulties there. You're listening to Damn the Absolute, a podcast about our relationship to ideas. Produced by Eradicus. Here's your host, Jeffrey Howard. Welcome, friends, philosophers, and fellow practitioners of ideas. This is episode 16 of Damn the Absolute. Answering questions about what it means for humans to flourish is difficult. Attempting any certainty as to what it means for non-human animals to flourish is even more confounding. And yet these questions have significant overlap. While some cultures have developed relationships that are responsive to the lives and needs of other animals, some communities, many stemming from modern Western traditions, have tended to view non-human animals more like resources, materials to be managed or controlled for the primary benefit of humanity. From this perspective, the natural world is mechanical, passive, and speechless, seen as distinct from the human world. But how might attending more to non-human perspectives and ways of being contribute to human flourishing? What, if any, more obligations do we have to the non-human members of our particular communities and households? Ike Sharpless is a political theorist interested in animal ethics and the history of science and philosophy. He holds two master's degrees from Tufts University, one in law and diplomacy, the other in animals and public policy. In addition to earning a master's degree in political science from UC San Diego, he's also studying to receive his doctorate. He advocates for a more inclusive view of human nature that obscures the divisions between humans and non-human animals, inviting us to reflect more on the sensorial encounters we have with other living beings. He takes us on a free-willing exploration into the challenging territories of animal flourishing, interspecies relationships, and how we might better accommodate non-human animals into our political and social systems. Now, some things worth considering. How confident can we be in our understanding of the inner lives of other animals? What are some tangible steps we can individually take to make right our relationships with other animals? In what ways do other living creatures contribute to human well-being, and what can we do to bolster animal flourishing? I hope you'll contribute to the conversation. Ike, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. We have a ritual practice here at Damn the Absolute. What is a viewpoint you've held as an adult you were certain at one point wouldn't change that's actually shifted dramatically for you? I don't know if I was certain, but I used to be pretty strongly utilitarian and Kantian and humanist, and now I'm less of all of those things and still, still sort of Kantian, still sort of humanist, still sort of utilitarian but not certain about any of those commitments. For those who are not particularly familiar with what any of those words mean, could you break those down a little bit in simple terms? Yeah. So if this is all philosophical language for sure, so there's other, other things in my life that, I, that are more, more broadly shifted in terms of viewpoints as I'm, I'm 40 and I was younger when I was younger. So I tended to have trouble when I was younger viewing how everything fit together. And I was a utilitarian in the sense that I liked John Stuart Mill. And I liked the idea, his idea that, that there's a sort of greater happiness and the sum, the sum of all individual happinesses. And that's sort of a, well, something we should aim for. But I've sort of given up on that whole way of looking at things as being fruitful, that in each individual utility, I have trouble valuing things that I used to be able to value the more I've looked at animals, the more I have trouble making sense of the way that human well-being relates to other forms of well-being and the way that's sort of commensurating one util with another. On Kantianism, it's not very much like utilitarianism, but I've proceeded from, I used to like a lot of work in Kant, and I still do, to reading a lot of Aristotle. So I'm an independent scholar. I used to be affiliated with UCSD. But I'm a polymath by nature, I think, like Aristotle and Peirce, a pragmatist who we may come to talk about. But humanism, I still think I'm broadly a humanist in many respects, but I'm critical of 
elements that, of humanism that can come to be dogmatic or religious in practice. Ike, your research focuses on ethical relationships between humans and non-human animals. What personal experiences have made these questions so compelling for you? Most recently, it was my wife and I adopted a, a beagle, a research beagle, Rodney, from a veterinary facility in Massachusetts, the, the Cummings School of Veterinary Medicine. And I had a close bond with him growing up. I had close bonds with other specific animals that I can recall. We had rats as a child, pet rats that my father brought home from his lab. I've always felt close to nature, partially because I've always been a little socially awkward, I think, and always looking down at the, the bugs and the plants. And so trying to be connected to the things outside of the human has always been a sort of big concern of mine as a child. And I've always been actually interested in how gendered some of our practices around caring about animals are because I, I came to be interested in caring about animal issues. And when I went to graduate school in the topic and was one of the only males in a group. And so it's just incidental, I think, but it's interesting to think about how we're socially enculturated to care about certain things or not care about other things. And so I've sort of been enculturated into a practice of thinking a lot about the way we do or don't care about certain forms of life. And it intersects with feminist practice and other things for me that, that are academic in a sense, but hopefully the pragmatic fit in here is that, that do fit into my daily life. And that's what I've gotten out of them, at least. Did it strike you as particularly unusual to be so interested in animals? Beyond a certain point, maybe? Like something you're supposed to outgrow? But no, it's, th it's something that's encouraged up to a point, but not really, I would say, beyond that point. But it's, I've, I've gone sort of deep into as political theory as a, as a field of inquiry, where it's not a, a necessarily intuitive place that a lot of people would think about non-human animals in some power relations and sort of broadly political concepts. But it does inevitably draw me to certain places when I think about these topics. A lot of ink has been spilled over the questions of human flourishing, but there's not a lot of conversation or writing that pertains to animal flourishing, at least in Western thought. How does one go about trying to understand what it means for an animal to flourish? Or where do you start? Well, I again start with the creatures I, I lived with, sort of with, with the animals that I've owned or, or sort of co-domesticated and, and working from there. But the problem is is also that that in political theory specifically, this question is is tangled up with one of the objects of my inquiry, Aristotle, who is said to be the first one also to separate out the human animal as being rational from other animals as being merely sensual. And so there's a long history in political theory that latches on to this, but he's also a, the, one of the first naturalist thinkers. And so I like to sort of draw at this at this tension using his work, but there's many others that one can use. And there's many people that do talk about these issues in contemporary work, animal flourishing. Donaldson and Kimlicka, Martha Nussbaum is one of the ones that I'm particularly sympathetic to. Nussbaum sort of latching onto aspects of, of Aristotle that we should focus on eudaimonia, well-being beyond just the domain of the human. For a human, for me to maybe understand what it is to flourish, I can have conversation and interact with someone and get a sense for what is important, what meets their needs. With other animals that are not human, there seems to be a much bigger gap. How do we bridge that gap? There's a, that's actually the name of a book by uh, Thomas Sudendorf, The Gap, and it's concerning this, this difference in animal minds that seems to be apparent in our ability, for instance, to plan into the future, to do a range of other sort of metacognitive practices that other animals don't seem to have access to. And so this comes up also with when we start thinking about our animals responsible for their own actions. Like, can we hold them accountable in a trial, for instance? Like, if we want to get involved in that level. Bridging the gap that you're talking about is a complicated topic, I would say. I also personally would want to link it to dualism in philosophy and a critique mm -hmm. of, of dualistic thinking that I'm personally interested in through a range of, I've been reading a book by a man named Loy, I think, Dualism in Buddhism and Beyond, which is sort of critiquing 
the the Cartesian framework by which we separate out these these things too simply. But that said, it's on the other hand, you are right that there are these differences, and it's it's too simplistic sometimes to just speak of giving rights to creatures that don't seem to have certain capabilities. But so that said, there's in each each individual case, you can walk through these issues, and it it the sort of the problem I think actually collapses of this gap. There's different worlds, but the gap is the space between our world and these different animal perspectival worlds that we often don't have really good reason to know, think that we understand properly. And we can imagine it though, using sort of different mechanisms. But the gap is really just the space between our worlds. And I think it's it would be a hubris to say like, it's just us that are smart and them that are not. There's another thinker who distinguishes between killjoys and romantics. I think it's Daniel Dennett that talks about this, but that's that he thinks that lots of people tend to either be killjoys or romantics with regard to animal mentition. So they think animal mind, killjoys think animal minds are not, there's not much there. There's not much going on there. And romantics are sort of the opposite and like, oh, I bet it's this wonderful palace of fantasy life or something. Whereas a scientist in a sort of disinterested sense is not supposed to be either of those things. These are sort of pitfalls of accurate thinking that we would want to sort of the romantic view. I think David Abram, a work I mentioned that I like, that I know I mentioned, I heard you like as well, is a little romantic. But I think he would be okay with with that he, that description as in it's not it's not always a bad thing. For listeners who have not read David Abram's Spell of the Sensuous, what are a few of the big takeaway points that you would like to connect here, Ike? Well, I love that book, and I'm reading the sequel to it right now, Becoming Human, or Becoming Animal, rather, which is which is great fun as well. But what I liked is his ability to connect his life with his experience of Western culture, his experience of indigenous cultures of various forms, of which what we call Western is just one, as he points out, and the reality of interbeing that he was able to experience, for instance, at the beginning with, there's a story about animal spirits that's really about ants. And these ants are are eating stuff in the house and the owners of the house leave little bowls of rice around for the ants so that they don't bother other things. But they have it as a kind of ritual and it's sort of organically pra- practiced in this community. And it's a sort of community older than sort of alienated strip mall life of Western industrialism. There's stories of him coming back to his, he's a, a, a sort of uh, American kid from the Midwest or something. I don't, I forget exactly, but, and then he goes and lives in Southeast Asia somewhere and he comes back and, and has an experience of sort of cultural shock and alienation. And I, I just really resonated with his de- desire to connect to this thing that's sort of underneath language, this thing that's underneath the rational. He's calling it the spell of the sensuous, this ability to connect to our being, so our body, but not just that. And sort of to, he has one example that I really loved of if you're just sitting in a field and you can try and breathe in everything in front of you, an open field, preferably it's sort of an open vista, breathe in your life to date and breathe out what's coming af- ahead of you. Sort of very big sort of met- metaphorical stories that I just really enjoyed. It's, it's hard to really put it into words because it's a critique of words that I feel like he's presenting. So there is like a puzzling element to talking about some of these things properly. But that said, for purposes of scientific practice, one should have to put something into words. And so there's different elements in life. I'm not, I'm, I'm not trying to reduce them necessarily. But I do think that for the scientific, one should try and be objective, disinterested. And you can do this in various ways. You can do this anthropologically as a practice, try and find multiple perspectives with which to examine animal sensoriums, which are very diverse, which, which can include uh, all kinds of ultrasound perception, like an octopus apparently can like see with their body, apparently. I don't, I don't know the details of this, but it's, or an elephant can hear underneath their feet things from far, far away. So hearing, we tend to think of with our ears and, and speaking with our mouth, but most of our perceptions are, are multimodal, integrated. And when we look at other animal forms of sensoriums and f- sensoria that are different than ours, we can sort of learn, well, A, just to respect the uniqueness of our own and every form. But anyway, I, I like that book. You're talking a lot about this being attentive to the non-human animals around us. And there's one story or perspective that David Abram 
talks about. And I remember he was found himself so immersed in some cultures that were so attentive to other animal species, including ants, that over time living this way, he found himself orienting around the natural rhythms of a lot more animals to the point in which he found himself routinely being visited by monkeys and all sorts of different animals that weren't attending to him before that as he became more attentive to them, they became much more responsive to him to the point in which I believe there was a visit from a condor or a large bird and they kind of had this dance back and forth. And that contrasted with his experience coming back to the States after living in this way in which there wasn't this attentiveness to other animal creatures and he felt that vitality was just cut off. That's a good way to put it. It's yeah, it's this this sense of not being connected to reality around oneself. And it's a, it's available to us at any moment, though, as he talks about as well in his other works. It's not just like this this sense of presence is something that's only available in distant foreign lands or something. To lean a little bit more into the maybe philosophy of science or questions of consciousness, and you've already brought up Daniel Dennett, who's done a lot of work on consciousness. Perhaps one of the most cited papers on consciousness is Thomas Nagel's What Is It Like to Be a Bat? What insights do you think that paper offers us when it comes to trying to answer questions about animal flourishing? So Nagel invites us to examine difference. Ultimately, I'm not sure about his conclusions, which are that there's not much that we can know about what it's like to be a bat. But he also allows us to see the limits of our own condition. So I'm, I don't know if Nagel's a great example for me, because I actually because he takes this example of bat cognition being very foreign from us, or not cognition, bat, a phenomenal perception. They use ultrasound rather than our, our primary vision. And so that this is supposed to be something quite different from our way of being, and therefore we don't have much to say about what it's like to be a bat. And so this is a famous piece in, in the literature, but actually, I don't know. I'm not, I'm, I, have, I don't have professional work on, published on this topic. I don't want to speak ill of philosophers or anything. You've alluded to moral agency, not just for humans, but for animals. What moral agency do you think animals have? There's an interesting saying, there's no bad dog, only bad owners that you may probably have heard. And intuitively, I, I, I see the appeal of this sentiment, but think that it's actually sort of insulting to dogs. Because if there's no bad dogs, how can there be any good dogs? And I've talked about this with people who didn't understand the point I was trying to make when they're like, no, 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 it's really just, it's really just the trainer. And like, then it's sort of like a debate similar to parenting. If you acknowledge their individuality, you can't just control them. And so I guess it would be about a question of whether the agency has to be specifically moral. And so whether we really, the extent to which we do hold an animal responsible for something, but we do in practice, again, and you chastise and there's arguments with, if you, uh, if with dog keepers about whether punishing your dog is like, is if, if you're engaging with some more sort of moral debate with them or something, otherwise it's a sort of control and dominance and authority game essentially. But then the question is, if you're engaged in a game of control and domination, this implies something else about if political power, if not moral power. And so I don't have like a pat answer because I don't think this is an on or off question and there's different kinds of sort of ethics and morality which we can get into. There's sort of the Franz de Waal model of building on a primate template of animal fairness with a Russian doll model that sort of builds out versus the more sort of robust Kantian version from like Chris Korsgaard, which is no, only rational agents capable of defending their actions are ethical agents and sort of full stop. And so there's reasonably disagreeing views, you have to sort of parse and see how they're disagreeing and like why they're disagreeing because the disagreement is often just linguistic or something, but not always. A major challenge here in regards to these ethical questions is the ability to clearly communicate with one another in which we've talked about earlier. If I were to assert that my dog has moral agency, but we have a limited ability to communicate with one another, where does that leave us then in regards to respecting their moral agency if they can't communicate to me that well what they want to do with their moral agency? So in the sense that they can't speak to you in words is sort of what you're getting at. Perhaps. Even, even body language, we can't, I think there's only a certain degree of confidence we can have as to what they mean by a lot of their body language without stepping into me projecting my human experience onto them as a canine. 
I think that's right. But I think that if you have a relationship and you learn to know each other, you can reasonably learn to know their body language without calling it anthropomorphism. You could call it mammalianism or something. You have to locate the proper index of the behavior. And in many cases, the proper index is not going to be Homer sapiens. And so it's not really anthropomorphizing behavior in that case. It's something else. It's something that has a deeper root in our, in our living co-legacy, essentially. That's not to say that you can carry out conversations with your dog about any given set of topics. <laughs> that would be fun. I mean, there's a famous line from Wittgenstein. If a lion could talk, we would not understand them. And people have disagreed about what that means even. There's interesting movies on this topic for those who are interested in sort of xenobiology and linguistics. Uh, the movie Arrival, it's based on a story by Ted Chang, who's a wonderful author. It's about this, essentially. It's, it's a spe I don't want to ruin it, but it's a, an alien species that is, processes time differently. And as a result, their language is, is odd and it's funny. Presumably, our dogs sort of process time the way do, we do. Like they get up, they do stuff at different times, like they go to bed. Like my parents have a dog that gets really excited at 5 p.m. He wants to go for walks, I can tell, at certain times. So he has a rhythm. And I, I get him. Like I seem to know what he wants by his demands on my behavior, but that's just what he wants from me. So again, it's a very limited outlook. And the case of dogs is, is actually somewhat infamous in the, in the field of cognitive ethology, precisely because of the force of the human dog bond. It makes it hard to really argue. It, it makes the argument for a kind of symbiotic super creature almost stronger, like that there's something going on there. But all that being said, I have some ethical qualms about pet keeping as such, based on these exact problems that you can't, uh, unlike in a regular relationship with a, with a human person, you can consent to be together. There is certain elements in which someone is being forced to be with someone else. But it's in most practical cases, it doesn't work out that way. And so my, some of my reservations are sort of just purely theoretical. And, and in certain cases, certain people maybe should be trained in different ways to treat animals differently. But it is rooted in this idea that some of these relationships are, are too, too human or too narcissistic or too rooted in the interest of a human to, to control. But on the other hand, I super identify with the companionship. I've had dogs since I was a kid. I'm a dog and cat person. Like I said, I had rats when I was growing up. So the idea of a non-human companion as a sort of window on the world, it's a sort of double-edged sword for me because it reminds me of John Berger's, John Berger's fav famous essay, Why Look at Animals, where he's talking about the sort of dangers of captivity and what they allow us, what they do to us as viewers, like in a zoo or something, when we, when we take our children to the zoo. He says, it's a sort of provocation, but one of the things that we tell them is that it's okay to put animals in cages. And so, I don't want to be making the pro provocative claim that pet keeping is, is like putting animals in cages, but I do want to be making the sort of provocative claim that it's of a family with it somehow. Like it's power we have over animal others that at the very least needs to be exercised with some great degree of respect and caution, but maybe even at some day will take us beyond that point. I'm enough of a liberal to be carried along with the human stream and to think that we could get somewhere better in the future maybe, but I don't know where that might be. And I'm not a person to enforce it on anyone. Do you think we should be orienting ourselves and our relationships with non-human animals in a more egalitarian way? Or is there too much of a power differential in regards to maybe our cognitive abilities or otherwise that that egalitarian approach may not be appropriate? I think egalitarianism is not really feasible, but the more common frame in animal ethics is abolitionism rather than egalitarianism that I'm that I come up against and hear upset against sort of uh, reform. And so the abolitionist argument is more it's, it's usually referred to as extreme because it is kind of extreme. It's it's a certain vegan argument that we should cease using all animal products, but it's not, it's sort of PETA says, for instance, yeah, all animals are equal is something they come up with, but it's, it collapses too much into in incoherence for me to entertain some of these arguments because as a scientist, at least someone who likes to call myself in certain hats I wear, a scientist, and I, I don't know what an animal is. I don't know. There's questions about definition that arise here and e equality. And so equality is probably not the right framework for thinking, thinking about some of these things, more like custodial citizenship or something. But it's again, it's a big topic. Answering questions of human flourishing are not a simple topic, but maybe a little bit easier to approach than questions of animal flourishing. 
what role do you think animals play in helping us as human beings to flourish? Well, there's a line from a, an anthropologist whose work I like, Anna Singh, who wrote the book, The Mushroom at the End of the World, that, that human nature is an interspecies relationship. And so it, it, it's to acknowledge that we are already entangled in all these relations. And the, the human move is to presume that we have somehow emerged from these relations. But really, at all levels, we're symbiotically entangled with life. So in our microbiome, we have more than 50% of our cells belong to something that is technically alien to us, but which constitutes us in a certain sense. And there are fungal networks that connect animal, plant, life all around us. And so I, I personally would want to view something in an, like that in an ecological language to sort of not separate out the human from the biome but then also to acknowledge our particular relationships of care that are not just with a human family and friends, with domestic animal others, but also with the animals that we eat, with the animals that are used in for experimentation for us, but then also not just animals in a sense. We don't have to sort of parse things so clearly, just the way we commodify life and plants. I mean, some of these are just due to the way we're looking at the object of inquiry, but the object of inquiry is also sort of philosophy of life and nature in, in my research and in my interests. And so it takes you into these sort of down these rabbit holes, to be, to be quite frank. So, Ike, you, you've raised a lot of questions that are difficult in regards to lifestyle choices. As each of us are trying to interrogate ourselves and the choices we make, most of us want to minimize the harm we do to others, including non human animals. I'd be curious to know. What has informed the choices you make in regards to some of these? Are you a meat eater? Are you vegan? Sure. How does it inform your consumer choices? So it's changed throughout my life. I've been many things. I'm, I'm not a doctrinaire person by nature, so I avoid sort of religious life plans that are dietary. And I view veganism as somewhat of a dietary religious life plan. That said, I, I'm a reducitarian, semi-vegetarian. I'm not entirely vegan. I, I try and eat small amounts of animal proteins relative to other things, eating low down on the food chain, eating in a sort of diet for a small planet kind of way. But that's also because I'm not a sort of perfect person. I don't claim to be free from guilt in most of my purchases. And so I don't claim to be free from guilt in my animal purchases either. I just claim to be mindful of them. And so I do buy things that are like animal welfare approved when I buy meat or animal products and it's viable. But as far as like whether and how I hold myself up to each individual decision, like I, I'm of the mind, honestly, that people shouldn't be too hard on themselves with regard to the ethics of their personal food choices in the sense that the way that our personal choices have been politicized is often not very healthy and is often leads to people moralizing each other and moralizing each other's food decisions. And food decisions can be very personal, can be very cultural. And I've encountered a lot of this stuff. And so I've sort of tried to navigate it to the best I can in my life, but ultimately just try to be conscientious and mindful the, the way that I can. I mean, sort of the most obvious example for me is like, I, I live in a place with lots of snails and I, and I have to be mindful literally of not stepping on snails. And that's like a very metaphorical thing for me because I hate it whenever I do it. Like I love watching them and I imagine thinking of what I'm doing to them when I just smush them down. I, I do it sometimes. I regret it. I live with it. The, on the thing about mindful sort of eating and not holding oneself too much to account, I think some of these decisions should be better dealt with politically by reforming food conditions in farms that are deemed objectionable or something. And so there's a lot of progress being made on that front now that it's a new administration that cares at all about such things. Hello, friends. Jeffrey here. Please go ahead, take a quick moment to click that subscribe button and rate us. It really helps us to further grow the community around Damn the Absolute. Enjoy the rest of the episode. Personal choices are one thing when it comes to our relationships with non-human animals. You are a political theorist by training. When you are attempting to figure out where animals fit into human political systems, what are your beginning points? What are the questions you try to answer first? I try and make a genealogy of the topic, which is why I start with Aristotle, because he's viewed as the one who starts this exclusion of animals from reasoning. But he's also a strange figure because he also, a lot of the rest of his work 
opens up a much more sympathetic view of looking at animals where you're looking at the sort of what is their form of life? What is their way of life? He's just a sort of a person looking interestedly at the world. There's a great book on this topic called The Lagoon by a biologist whose last name is Leroy. And he sort of sees this Aristotle and a person just fascinated by the abundance of the world, examining the world. And, and so theories of politics is sort of too big, a, a too ambitious a topic for, for this, like levels of organization, types of organization, sort of older than politics, some anthropological discourse and sort of the, what's going on in contemporary work is more like the introduction into politics of work in animal ethics. So the extension of work that was more normative in scope, originating in stuff like Peter Singer's famous work from the 1970s, and then sort of trickling down to in the 1990s and subsequently a continuous sort of stream of, of work interested in these primarily moral questions, these primarily normative questions, and then basically pushing that into political discourse. So it's not really a good fit necessarily. I mean, like a, these are, this is like asking animal ethics questions with a veneer of politics, arguably. It's not really doing political science in some respects, which is fine. I mean, ethics are important. But political science is about empirical inquiry into political phenomena, at least as it's presently construed. Political science is a weird discipline. It has, it's like schizophrenic and heterogeneous in nature. Like it's because I'm a political theorist, but within political theory, there is positive political theory, which is a certain research program or the history of political thought, which is more what I'm interested in, where you study sort of canonical thinkers and examine the, the Western tradition, which is interesting as well, but also becomes problematic to focus on too much because it's the sort of the erudition of dead white men unpacked and insufficiently examined and then canonized too much. And so I'm not really here for some of that either, to be to be quite frank. I like the American disrespect for politics that's present in philosophical pragmatism at least. But it doesn't always mesh well with the institutions of academia. It's a sort of constant thing. I mean for me it's also because I'm not a very organized writer, thinker all over the place. But I love the topics I'm interested in. And I feel, I do feel a deep connection to them and I, I want to keep at it. So, But the, the, the animal domain in politics is mostly, again, a history of exclusions and a history of the extent to which these topics have not been talked about in most elements of political theory that one can think about. Political science is in the common discourse is like, you know, what does your government do? What do they do for you? It's not what is a political agent? Does it have to be a human? What is political intercourse? What constitutes a polity? So Aristotle is also a good place to start because he just, he says the state is prior to the family in, in nature. And sort of the state is self-sufficient, the polity, the, the, the polis is the thing that can be self-standing, unlike an individual human family. And so this is his theory of man, humanity, as a political animal, a zoon politicon. And so the political animal is, is us. So woohoo, like we win the political animal festival. <laughs> but we're just one kind of political animal. And even Aristotle was talking about how we're like especially political. And some other animals are social. And some other animals are even political too, he says, like ants, cranes, bees. Ants and bees are socially, social insects are like famously political for him, but they don't have a hegemon. He thinks cranes, he, he somehow he thinks cranes do have a hegemon, which is weird, a leader, but also that they're political, but not quite like us, like not as political as us, because we're sort of, we can deliberate over ends that we want to choose in life and we can get together and organize. And as a result, we can do what he says to joint activity towards common ends. So we can deliberate jointly and then act together is the sort of beauty of human action for Aristotle. And I agree. I don't want to diminish that. So while I think we should be humble in some respects, I think we should also be proud in other respects. It's, it's a bit of a paradoxical situation. The role of the human, we don't want to elevate it too much. It's just sort of anthropocentrism properly understood is how I would frame that particular issue. Because there's people who would be inclined to say we need to reject all anthropocentrism for fear of imposing a human stamp on, on the other, on alterity or, or what have you. But I think we first of all need to understand what it's like to be the thing we're like in order to draw reasonable comparisons between other forms of life. So it's not reasonable to say that we can just do away with our own humanness in the project of trying to understand other forms. It has to be there, sort of. So you've talked about how it's uncomfortable for you to piece together non-human animals into human politics and that there is a history there of other animals being excluded. 
There are some people, one thinker in particular comes to mind, Wendell Berry likes to talk about community and understanding community as all living beings within a particular place. And that includes humans and non-human animals. How much does that resonate with you? And what does it mean for us to include non-human animals in our communities? It resonates a lot. I love his localism and bioregionalism. And it's it resonates in a couple different ways because I live in a very urban area. I live in San Diego, right next to UC San Diego in a mostly suburban area. There's a little canyon down by my house that I go walk in every day. And there's little, there's birds that are right outside my house and I value them as much of part of my daily experience. So I, I resonate with that on a personal level, but I also resonate with that theoretically with some limits. So the discourse over place is important to me, but I would want to bound it with a sort of more universalizing tendency. And so Barry is not a conservative per se, and I have no problem with conservatism per se, but there are sort of reactionary tendencies in place-based rhetorics that can be not especially helpful for thinking through some of these things. But that said, most of that doesn't necessarily address the animal per se. I mean, it's not It's true, for instance, that the Nazis were ecologically minded. And so there is a sort of far right connection to some get back to nature thinking, which if you think through the logic of it is is coherent and disturbing in its logic. I mean, it's this land is not for, for instance, the Jewish people. This land is for the Aryan people and that and and also all of creation to go along with us, but only with us or something. And so that that sort of scary ethno nationalist rhetoric can just fuck off, in my opinion, to be frank. But that said, I also don't like the sort of homogenizing corporate hand of the neoliberal economy, which is the opposite extreme in some respects. It's not even the opposite. We don't have to paint this that in terms of left and right necessarily. It's often viewed as too centrist. But I don't read, I'm interested in these questions about what stands beyond capitalism and how democracy can organize in the face of global capitalism and even what that means precisely. There's a lot of bullshit again in there, to be kind of frank. But at the local level, for us living our regular daily lives, to be able to have those interactions is what I value so highly. And I live in a nice neighborhood and I have lots of people who make my nice neighborhood nice for me, humans and otherwise, who come in, humans who come and clean the surroundings in my neighborhood. And so mostly what I would be interested in is getting other people in the world provisions that I feel I have. I I feel I'm very well and I want integrated communities. So I have this beautiful canyon by my house. Not everyone can have a beautiful canyon. There's only, there's so many people in the world. We can only live so many places. We can't all go live out in the woods. So making urban spaces more livable, I think is a very important thing for helping people, but it's a real challenge. Because uh, there's, it's if one has the, the the get up and go, one can always go live somewhere else, or if one has the financial resources, or just whatever, like the the means, variously understood, psychologically even. But living in places that are nature deprived, in urban spaces or, or otherwise, but especially the concrete jungle, I think can do this to you, can be quite psychologically harming as well. So so animals provide psychological solace, among other things, just as part of nature. Going back to the question of human flourishing, it should be apparent to most of us the incredible benefits that humans have and receive oftentimes at the hands of our non-human co-inhabitants of Earth. What benefits do you think animals have that they receive from humans? In what ways do you think we contribute to their flourishing? We contribute in many ways. So there's a good book by Michael Pollan, The Botany of Desire, which actually talks about how the, the apple, the marijuana plant, and two other plants I'm, I'm forgetting the names of, how in a sense it's one-sided of us to view these things as humanly used because in a sense the apple is using us and the marijuana plant is using us as well. And so whether we want to say that of the cow as well, I have difficulties there. And so the, the the mere propagation of the organism versus the well-being of an individual. And so I'm more inclined to think of the well-being of an individual when there's brains and nervous systems involved as there are with cows and not plants, but sort of the philosophy of plants. Sentience is an interesting and emerging one, emerging one but like, you know, don't worry, you can still eat your salads for those of you who are concerned about <laughs> pain. I'm concerned about pain too, but I like, I like salads. I think there's many other ways in which we can cultivate a life 
that is individually better for indiv- for the, the large majority of animals. There's only so much we can do individually, though. And I don't want to put this moral burden necessarily on each of you listeners individually for the reasons I was just talking about. But that said, there's practices in animal husbandry, for instance, in, in European animal husbandry, they, they give enrichment to pigs that are raised for food. Whereas for the most part here in America, the, because of USDA as it is at present, maybe this will change. They don't require that for the most part. And enrichment meaning like a pig needs to have like a ball in its pen or like a little dangly something to play with, some sort of sensory stimulation. Otherwise, the animal will become sort of insane with stereotypical behavior over time. And so this is an example where you can avoid harm by providing a little bit of well-being. And that's sort of at the low end of flourishing. It's not a very high bar to put a ball in a, in a pig's cage, but it's higher than you might think, given the production requirements of these facilities, and which are not easy places to work for humans either often, and are often made out to be, and I don't want to pick, speak ill of animal agriculture. I think there's a tendency to sort of villainize factory farming as an industrial villain, where there's a lot of sort of American pastoral, small is beautiful. I don't want to say it's naive, but I want to say it's a little unfair of where we get most of our food and sort of not addressing the real elements of the problem. Like I go to Whole Foods when I can, but it's expensive. And I think most people have recognized that we need, we need, we want affordable food, but similarly with like experimental drugs or something, we, we don't want to harm rats or beagles, but we sort of don't really want to know, actually, probably, that all the drugs that we use are tested on these animals prior to being tested on humans. They usually are drugs require two non-human models after in vitro testing before human clinical trials. But in a sense, we do want to know because we don't want these things to kill us. So these are difficult ethical questions that are often not fully sort of thought through in, in some respects. But as far as just regular day-to-day flourishing, I mean, you could get you could adopt a, a dog. That would help the dog. <laughs> if, if you treat it well, <laughs> if you guys get along, it would flourish for, for the both of you. Because that's a different story, though. That's about creating a relationship, which goes beyond. I mean, you can try and respect the animal that you're consuming. I still just by blessing your meal or whatever, if you engage in any of that kind of stuff. But that's a different sort of practice, I think. I think most of us, even the many of us who are naturally attuned to the the suffering and pains of other animals, feel many complicated emotions about our relationships toward animals, as you've demonstrated yourself. For those of us who are wanting to, if possible, make right the relationships that we have with other animals, what are a couple questions you would offer listeners as questions they can ask themselves to get into better relationships with our fellow inhabitants of the earth? I I would probably return to these these sensory questions, again, which I'm so interested in, these regarding our sensorium, the way we inhabit the world as a primate of a particular kind. And if you look into yourself, you'll see this, like, how do I, how is the way I look at the world determined by my organism's nature? How might my dog look at the world differently if you have a dog? Or how might your cat look at the world differently? So, there's commonalities. All three of us, in this case, are broadly predatorial animals. And so we we sort of seek things out in the environment in a very sort of exploratory way. But if you were to try and inhabit the perspective of like a, a sheep, for instance, it might be a little different. It's interesting, some of these questions about predator prey things. Val, Val Plumwood talks about this again in her book, The Eye of the Crocodile. Another question sort of sticking to this, this sort of theme of, of sensations is, is how we hear the world, how we see and hear the world. So we imagine that what we see what is, is what is in the world. But one of the reasons I like the study of animal cognition is that it opens you to wonderment at the nature of things because there's animals that can perceive above the visible light. For us, the visible light spectrum is called that because it's visible to us, like to humans. And there's animals that can see in infrared or ultraviolet uh, because they have reason to do so. We don't really have much reason to do so. So it's interesting to think that while we're looking around us, we're sort of seeing what we have reason to see in a sense. Well, Ike, thank you so much for providing us a freewheeling conversation to the many difficult questions that come up with human flourishing, especially as it relates to our non-human animal community members. So thank you so much for coming on. Yeah, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you for listening to Damn the Absolute. I hope you found our conversation worthwhile. 
We would love it if you could leave us a review wherever you listen to podcasts, whether that is Stitcher, iTunes, CastBox, or one of the many other options available to you. It goes a long way in helping us to build a community committed to fruitful ideas. See you next time.